Hello, and welcome to episode 28 of Not Reserving Judgment, a podcast about the latest intrigues, triumphs, and outrages in Canadian constitutional law. I'm Josh DeHaas, counsel with the Canadian Constitution Foundation. I'm Christine Van Gein, the CCS Litigation Director. And I'm Joanna Barron, the Executive Director of the Canadian Constitution Foundation. In today's episode, we'll tell you about why two Montreal universities are suing the government and why the case has an interesting free trade angle. I'll walk you through some highlights of the decision by the Quebec Court of Appeal that found that the province's secularism law banning religious symbols by state employees cannot be challenged. And we'll share our bad legal takes of the week where we take a lighthearted look at some legal opinions that didn't quite land. But first, I'm going to update you on some civil and criminal lawsuits involving high-profile members of the Freedom Convoy. So as listeners of this podcast are probably aware, the Trudeau government has refused to accept Justice Mosley's federal court decision that found the invocation of the Emergencies Act against the trucker convoy protest was unlawful and unconstitutional. And late last month, they formally appealed. Just today, in fact, they posted their response to the commission that was held just over a year ago now, and I haven't even looked at that yet. And this past week, we filed our notice of cross appeal in response. So while we believe Justice Mosley got most of it right, he got it right on all of the the big points, we will be there to also uh, cross appeal on his finding that freedom of peaceful assembly somehow was not violated. So that's what that cross appeal is about. Now, we've been really focused on the judicial review because it's a, it's our case and it's a really big, really important case. But there have been some other big legal developments related to the trucker convoy in recent weeks, and we keep getting asked about them. So I decided this would be a good time to give you a little update on where things are at with some of these criminal and civil lawsuits that we're not involved with directly, but are keeping an eye on. So the first really big development is that two of the four men who were arrested near the border blockade at Coots, Alberta on Valentine's Day 2022, so this was the same day as the invocation of the act, were released earlier this month on time served. And this suggests that the Crown maybe didn't believe that they had enough evidence to convict these two men of conspiracy to commit murder against RCMP officers, which is what was alleged. So these guys are named Jerry Morin and Christopher Lysak, and they both uh, pleaded guilty to far less serious firearms charges uh, as part of this plea deal. So they were among the four people charged after that infamous cache of weapons, ammunition, and body armor was found at Coots and then splashed across the national media. As Justice Mosley noted, the Trudeau government relied on this discovery to justify its opinion that there was a serious risk to national security. But Justice Mosley also obviously noted that this situation was dealt with by the RCMP using the criminal code before the special measures were even enacted. So you didn't need the Emergencies Act to do it. In fact, Justice Mosley said in his opinion that the arrests at Coots were the only evidence of serious violence that Ottawa had provided. And it couldn't be a national emergency if it was limited to one part of Alberta. But we still don't know exactly how serious that local, and I stress local, not national threat was. And the mainstream media doesn't seem all that interested in finding out. So you may recall a lot was made at the time about the fact that the body armor that was found along with the weapons was marked with the insignia of this group called Diagalon. And you're probably wondering, what is Diagalon again? Well, that really depends on who you ask. According to the self-described anti-fascist Trudeau government-funded Canadian Anti-Hate Network, the mainstream media's favorite source on these things, Diagalon is a white supremacist extremist group that wants to build an ideal nation state running diagonally from Alaska through the western provinces of Canada all the way to Florida. And um, according to the Minister of Public Safety, when he spoke at the Rolo Commission, The Diaglon patches that were found were potential, quote, ideological symbolism, i.e. evidence of possible terrorism or extremism, and the group in Coots was, quote, a hardened cell. 
But if you ask freelance journalist Kara Massad, who looked at the various national security reports, including from the RCMP, they don't seem to believe that Diag Diagalon really was some sort of terrorist group. To them, it seems more like a satirical internet community based on this imaginary right-wing country called Diagalon, which has this charismatic uh, leader who brought people together in support of the Freedom Convoy. And obviously, I don't know which I don't know who's right here. We're not going to get to the bottom of what Diagalon is on this podcast, but. What we do now know is that two of the four men charged with conspiracy to commit murder against police at Coots, which was one of the main justifications for invocation of the Emergencies Act, have now had those really serious charges dropped, but not after serving 723 days in custody. And in National Post this week, the writer Gwyn Morgan had a column that was headlined, truckers get jail time while real criminals get bail and parole. And it points out that these men who had uh, no history of violent offenses were denied bail and then spent more than two years behind bars. Well, people who do actual violent things are often released on bail where they commit further violent offenses while they're released. And Morgan also points out that Tamara Litch spent several weeks in jail and faced severe bail conditions when she was finally released, despite the fact that the charges she's facing and her trial continues. This is like the never ending trial. Those those charges were not particularly serious in normal circumstances. So Morgan's conclusion is that these people were essentially political prisoners. And he says, quote, what else can explain the stark discrepancy between the Crown's treatment of the nonviolent convoy leaders and its pervasive and persistent empathy for habitual criminals and even murderers, Morgan writes. You know, like I said, I don't know all the facts here, but I really do want to know more about why these four men were charged, why the charges for two of them have now been dropped, you know, whether there really was some sort of conspiracy to commit murder and whether Diagalon really is some sort of um, extremist or terrorist like group or whether it's more of a joke. And uh, since since the other two members of this so-called hardened cell remain in prison, we might still find out if this all goes to trial and we will have to wait and see before coming to any real conclusions on this. And just very quickly, the other big convoy news is that there are now at least two separate lawsuits seeking damages based on Justice Mosley's ruling. So trucker Chris Barber, who's facing criminal trial alongside Tamara Litch, filed a statement of claim in Saskatchewan this week. And I haven't seen it, but CBC reports that Barber is suing over the nine days that his bank accounts were frozen by the emergency orders, which he says caused fear and anxiety, defaulting on loans and damage to his credit score. And the other lawsuit, uh, I have seen this statement of claim. It's from about 20 people who were involved in the convoy and also, you know, some of them had their bank accounts frozen. It names the Attorney General of Canada, the PM, Christian Freeland, Bill Blair. RCMP, the aforementioned Canadian Anti-Hate Network, all of the banks, and in regards to the banks, it alleges breach of contract, negligence, unlawful interference, trespass to chattels, conversion, civil conspiracy, it goes on and on. And in regards to police, it alleges battery, harassment, intimidation. It also alleges misfeasance in public office, which is something that is very hard to prove. And it alleges defamation by all sorts of people, including Canadian Anti-Hate Network. And these uh, these convoy participants are seeking $100,000 each for defamation, $100,000 each for the negligence, assault, battery, et cetera, $50,000 each in charter damages, and a million dollars in punitive damages. And I don't know a lot about all of these torts that, that, that are in this statement of claim, and I don't know the particulars of each person's situation. So... I have no idea what will happen with these uh, civil lawsuits, but uh, I certainly will be following closely uh, to see what the result is. Joanna, do you have any thoughts on this uh, this situation with the, the men at Coots or these civil lawsuits? Yeah, I don't think we'll ever know exactly why the charges were, why, why they were released for time served. I don't think the Crown has any particular motivation to reveal that. Um, on the Barber uh, civil lawsuit and the charter damages, because we got a lot of questions about this, and 
you know, in the aftermath of the decision of the judicial review being released, we were so euphoric. Um, and it kind of brought me down to earth that basically what most journalists and members of the public were interested in was, well, does this mean that the government is going to be on the hook for a ton of money? And like, what's the practical input impact? And I understand that because we are weird uh, constitutional civil rights lawyers. And for us, just having a judicial declaration that the government overreach is like huge. Like that's that's the biggest reward to us. That's the biggest reward in terms of enduring precedent. Um, and the, you know, the impact of showing that there are fetters on this type of authority. But I also understand how members of the public are just like, yeah, but so what? Uh, so we'll be watching this closely. One other sort of interesting moving piece in this question of charter damages um, and when, whether the government can be liable for this type of malfeasance, although here they're just acting pursuant to, you know, a valid legislative act. There's no question in the judicial review that the Emergencies Act itself is constitutional. That also has been something that I've seen people get wrong, that the D Justice Mosley found the EA itself was unconstitutional. No, they just found that the, he found that the invocation of it um, didn't meet the statutory standards. Christine, anything to add about Tamara Litch? We were talking about her yesterday at our town hall and her medieval shackles at her bail hearing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the, we wrote about this in our book, Pandemic Panic. The treatment of Tamara Litch was insane. Denied bail. Um, she was brought into the courtroom in shackles. This is a nonviolent first time offender with charges that, you know, compared to you know, the things that people get bail for, like repeat weapons offenses and murder, uh, to have this first time offender with, you know, pretty comparably insignificant charges be brought out in shackles and denied bail is outrageous. And then the conditions on her bail, um, you know, she, she was, she was accused of violating a condition of her bail because she went to a dinner that had honored her for, uh, her role in uh, the movement. So just completely, you know, it's so frustrating to me the way this government acts like we're so tough on crime. Look how we're going to treat this little grandmother. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, they're letting, you know, Paul Bernardo go to, to lower secure security prisons. Luca Minotta, this, this other serial killer go to, um, have be switched to a to a, a lesser secure facility i just i cannot take this government seriously when they act like they're tough on crime uh and it seems to me very uh much like it depends on what type of offense you committed and and in the case of tamara leach it was you know offending the government christine i don't mean to interrupt you but you have misgendered luca magnata who now goes by Violet. <laughs> so okay. I just wanted to point oh, I didn't that know out. that. Yeah, that's why he has been moved to a me. new facility. Use the and right again, pronoun here. I, I'm going to file a complaint <laughs> under the <laughs> online harm set. Yeah, I've, um, <laughs> I've, I've done so much harm to yeah. this serial killer who decapitated men. And sent um, their head to Prime Minister Stephen Harper. I remember covering that story as a journalist. It was, it was really, really cool. My God. Job. Back to here. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're, we're a little yeah. sidetracked here. Let's get back to. Uh, okay. Why don't you give us your headline, Christine, unless you have more to say? Yeah. I'll, okay. So I'll move on to my headline now. I want to tell you about a new legal challenge that was in, just announced by McGill University and Concordia University against the Quebec government. Uh, because this, this case, these cases have some really interesting arguments that stood out to me. So McGill and Concordia are suing the Legault government for two policies. The first policy is a tuition increase for Canadian students from outside Quebec in their undergraduate and professional programs. And the second policy is changing to the funding model for international students. Now, as a practical matter, these changes have led to a drop in applications and the institutions expect that it will actually devastate them financially. The changes disproportionately impact English universities like McGill and Concordia. And in terms of the impact they've already had, these policies have already had, starting this fall, tuition for students from the rest of Canada who study at McGill or Concordia will see an increase of 33%. 
And McGill says that this has led to a decline in applications of 20% and Concordia by 27%. And keep in mind, McGill is one of Canada's top universities. I'm I'm sure Joanna will say it is the top university in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to University of Toronto, so I disagree. But it really is an exceptional school. And I have spoken to people in Quebec who are really worried that this policy will destroy one of our country's best institutions, sort of in the name of bringing everyone down to the same level, which is a lower, less um, high achieving level. And from a practical policy perspective, this just seems like a terrible idea to destroy McGill. Uh, but McGill is arguing not just that this is a bad policy at ground level, they're arguing that the changes are illegal and unconstitutional as well. So the McGill is arguing that these two policies constitute discrimination under the charter as well as under the Quebec charter. They are arguing that these policies were an unreasonable exercise of the powers of the Minister of Higher Education since they're incompatible with the mission assigned to her by the Act, by the Ministry of Higher Education Act. They are arguing that these policies were adopted following inadequate consultation and an unfair process, that the policies constitute a disguised and illegal tax, which is being imposed without authorization by the legislature, the National Assembly, as it's called in Quebec. And this is the most interesting one to me. They argue that these policies create unconstitutional barriers to interprovincial trade, thereby limiting student mobility choice of university and access to education. And it's this last one that really stands out. I'm always looking for interprovincial trade cases because the protection for interprovincial trade is provided for in our constitution, uh, the Constitution Act 1867 in a section called 121. It, there has been some degree of success over section 121 in uh, litigation over the years. There was a really famous case that some of you may remember from a few years ago that we at the CCF were involved in. It's called the Como case, uh, also called the Free the Beer case. And Como involved uh, a man named Como from New Brunswick who lived in a border town and drove into Quebec to buy beer because it was cheaper in Quebec. He was pulled over by police on his way back into New Brunswick. Uh, the police, for some reason, I guess we're not very busy catching real criminals like Luca Magnata and Paul Bernardo and doing real, real policing work. And they were really concerned with, you know, men wanting discounted beer. So they pulled him over, confiscated his beer and gave him a fine. And this was litigated. We said that this violated Section 121 of the Constitution Act. Uh, 1867, we were involved in the case. And the idea is that we have one country and we have one market and that this was an interprovincial trade barrier. And we had some success at the lower courts, but unfortunately, a pretty devastating and weird loss at the Supreme Court. The loss was because the province had argued that they had jurisdiction to regulate alcohol on the basis of health care. So this case from Quebec and about McGill presents a new opportunity to make an argument about internal trade barriers. Specifically, McGill is making this novel argument that Section 121 of the Constitution Act could extend to apply to the trade in services. So I'm really interested in this case. So we're monitoring it. And, you know, we're probably a year away from this case being heard on the merits because McGill has asked for a stay of the tuition changes. But we're going to keep watching this and see where things go. Um, Joanna, any reaction to this case? You so, want to get in and defend McGill here? Yeah, so I, I don't want to say too much because as you mentioned, we are monitoring this case. We are considering ourselves getting involved. Um, obviously, the interprovincial trade issue is very interesting to us. If we think about how we want mobility of things like doctors and nurses, like it seems to me that there's a very strong prima facie argument um, about um, education and services. And there's a sort of open rumor going around that the McGill is considering opening a campus outside of Quebec to mitigate against the hit that they know that they're going to take in terms of their enrollment. McGill is obviously hugely attractive to international students and not just, um, 
you know, not just from far away, like I had many colleagues, even in law school that were from the US who thought the prospect of being able to study um, in a bilingual city in a, you know, I think the truth is, and my colleagues, my, sorry, my colleagues at McGill may uh, resent me for saying this, is that I agree that U of T is probably the preeminent academic university. Yeah. And, uh, but, <laughs> but McGill certainly has the stronger international reputation, right? The sort of McGill being the Harvard of Canada line, like Americans definitely recognize McGill more than U of T. And it's kind of something only Canadians know that actually U of T is a better school. Part of that reason, though, is because of Quebec, the Quebec government chronically underfunding and to some extent snubbing McGill. And my understanding of the politics of McGill is that for a long time, they have tried to play nice with the Quebec government even as the Quebec government, as I'm going to talk about in a moment, has increasingly gone down a rabbit hole of becoming uh, nationalistic and very much more oriented towards serving um, Franco-nationalist uh, sensibilities. Um, I, I like that they are finally pushing back and getting some backbone. So we'll see how this goes. Um, the whole thing is just curious to me. The Quebec education minister Pascal Derry is actually a friend of mine, um, and she's a bilingual Montreal Jewish woman. And so I just think this is an interesting issue for her to be pushing, but I understand the politics of the province. Um, so watch this space and well done, McGill. We are rooting for you, or at least I'm rooting for you, um, only on the basis of internal free trade, of course. Josh, what do you think? I'm a little bit torn about this because as much as I don't like the McGill bashing and I don't like seeing, you know, Quebec use McGill as a as a scapegoat for some of its problems, um, I'm kind of here for the Concordia bashing because it's got this long history of being the <laughs> the Montreal headquarters for Hamas and various other uh, extremist groups. And they just announced they're going through a several year plan to fully decolonize and indigenous indigenize the entire curriculum and I don't know um I don't know I'm not that much in love with with Concordia but no the the interprovincial trade issue is actually really interesting I mean the whole point of confederation or one of the major points was to create free trade um if you read about the history of Canada uh these provinces got together because there were you know, tariffs in the United States that were going to affect them and they needed a bigger market. And so it's kind of absurd that in 2024, we still have, you know, worse inter internal trade barriers between provinces than European countries have uh, with each other. Those are like different countries, right? So um, anybody who's interested in this, they should read Ryan Maduch's book. Uh, it is called Booze, Booze Cigarettes and Constitutional Dust Stops. Great name. Yeah. And it goes through some of this history. So yeah, I won't say too much about the legal arguments of the case in case we do intervene, but um, here for the Concordia bashing, not so much the, the McGill bashing. Um, let's go to a break. And when we come back, uh, Joanna, you can tell us about our other headline, which happens to also be from Quebec this week. Hi, I'm Russell from the CCF. In case you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our email newsletter, The Freedom Update, to get updates from me every week about our ongoing work and the legal stories in Canada that keep us interested. Along with our new podcast, Not Reserving Judgment, it's one of the best ways to stay up to date. Subscribe at the ccf.ca slash freedom update. Okay, so we're back to Quebec with a juggernaut, almost 300 page decision that came out from the Quebec Court of Appeal last week on Bill 21, the so-called laicite or secularism law. Um, and just a very brief bit of background on this, because I'm kind of obsessed with this whole uh, occurrence and topic in Quebec. So the background is something that was struck in 2007 called the Bouchard-Taylor Commission. And that was struck in response to a perception um, that uh, the Franco uh, Franco Quebec majority in, was starting to become unsettled by growing multiculturalism, growing growing pluralism in the province, and so political scientists um, Bouchard and the famous political 
philosopher Charles Taylor um, ran a commission and delivered a report. And the commission was actually going on when I started law school in 2007 at McGill, and they would host like town halls across Montreal, but also across the whole province. Um, so it was pretty cool, especially because I, I studied political science as an undergrad to see kind of like political science going on on the ground. And in the report, which was released in 2008, um, it was recommended that agents of the state who occupy positions that exemplify state neutrality um, and who could exercise, quote unquote, coercion, um, like police officers, prosecutors, judges, um, should be facially neutral. So they should not wear any outward religious symbols. They should not wear face coverings. They should project an appearance of secularism. And in part, this was due to a concern that there could be a conflict between the principles of equality and particularly gender equality um, and religious accommodation and pluralism. So the Bouchard-Taylor Commission uh, tried to square these competing values by saying, yes, it's fine that Quebec adopt a posture of total secularism. However, they did not extend these, uh, these prescriptions to uh, things like uh, school teachers, public school teachers, and actually in 2017, in the aftermath of the Charter of Quebec Values, um, which went even further and said, you know, all agents of the state, including public school teachers, elementary, high school, what have you, um, cannot wear any external religious symbols. And Charles Taylor wrote an op-ed in 2017 saying that he no longer, he basically disavowed most of what he wrote in, his, in the report um, and that he thought it was misinterpreted by many politicians. So sorry, Charles Taylor. Um, <laughs> uh, the Quebec government kind of ran with it in a way that he didn't predict, perhaps wrongly. But let's get back to the decision. Um, and I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the highlights, because as I mentioned, it is about 300 pages. Um, and a lot of it is very arcane, like going through different statutes that uh, that were found to be enforced before the Confederation of Canada. And so I don't think that's really relevant. But the upshot of the decision is that the Quebec Court of, Court of Appeal upheld almost every aspect of Bill 21, the bills uh, concerning secularism, uh, which again, bans teachers, police officers, jail guards, judges, etc., even healthcare professionals from wearing religious symbols whilst on the job. They did strike down an exemption for English school boards, um, which had been carved out by the trial court judge. Um, so Anglo Montrealers, very displeased about this. And only one provision was found to be unconstitutional. Uh, and that was a provision which banned members of the uh, National Assembly from wearing face coverings. Um, and that was because of parliamentary privilege and the right which is protected under section three um, of the charter that you have the right to hold your seat once elected, even if you wear a hijab or uh, another type of religious face covering. So the court rejected all of the arguments that were made and there was a vast slew of parties that are came, came to the court in opposition to Bill 21 from the Lord Reading Law Society, which is the Jewish Law Society of Montreal, um, the Sikh Association, the Muslim Association, sort of like a very wide swath of Quebec civil society, all making kind of similar suite of arguments. And they, they did kind of throw everything at the wall, I have to say. Um, so the court found that this Bill 21 was not ultra virus, the division of powers. Um, it was argued uh, by the anti-Bill 21 parties that the purpose of the bill was colorable and actually had a concealed criminal law purpose uh, to stigmatize or penalize religious individuals. Um, the court found that if you look at the debates and the purpose of the act, it was clearly to establish the secularism of the state. Uh, I think that that's correct. I don't think there's a colorable hidden criminal purpose. Um, then the parties argued that there were unwritten constitutional principles um, that the bill violated. Uh, the court roundly rejected this, that unwritten constitutional principles can't override enumerated rights, uh, which actually is a principle that at the CCF we have taken in <laughs> cases like Toronto v. Ontario, um, the Toronto City Council case. So I agree with that. And as I mentioned, uh, there were very arcane, sort of archaic statutes that 
the parties, the anti-Bill 21 parties tried to argue were part of Canada's constitutional architecture pre-Confederation and Bill 21 violated them. Court also roundly rejected that. Um, then we get to the notwithstanding clause. And I'm going to be brief in my comments because we've talked about this a lot recently and the extended uh, and somewhat confusing debates about how the notwithstanding clause operates. Um, but the court's findings do come down on one side of the debate about whether once a legislature invokes the notwithstanding clause, if courts can still undergo um, constitutional review and say, well, yes, um, even though this act is operable, we're still going to make some comments on the charter, um, the charter validity, uh, its implications for various charter rights. So the court clearly comes down uh, on the Team Sigillet, uh, Team Foucault-Menal side of this, explicitly takes up the Lecky and Mendelssohn argument um, that invocation of the notwithstanding clause does not shield a given act from constitutional review. Um, they say no. The court says Section 33 effectively operates as a, quote, constitutional privative clause, and they don't undertake any substantive review of its possible implications for charter rights, which I think if, if you did, you would find clearly that there would be problems with equality, um, with freedom of religion, uh, et cetera. Um, so that, that is the latest on that from the Quebec Court of Appeal. The parties also made this argument, and I heard this about, I guess it was a year or a year and a half ago, because um, I have a lot of friends who are uh, Anglos in Montreal and Francos as well. Most Montrealers are not into this because Montreal is a very pluralistic um, city. And the argument that I was I was hearing was that the legislature can't just invoke Section 33 just based on formal requirements, that there are certain substantive requirements that have to be met. And uh, we didn't get involved in this appeal because I didn't find that convincing at all at the time. Um, and the judge, the Court of Appeal also roundly rejects this. So the parties in the appeal tried to argue that there were substantive requirements, various substantive requirements. One suggestion is that in order to invoke Section 33, uh, the legislature needs to do something like a Section 1 justification exercise, or courts in reviewing the invocation of Section 33 should do something like a justification exercise to say if the objectives that the legislature is trying to meet, so here it would be secularism of the state, whether that is sufficiently um, sufficiently important to balance against the violations on rights of freedom of religion. Um, and the court also rejects this. They find that only formal requirements need to be made, need to be met in order to properly invoke Section 33. Um, and it also said in terms of the uh, submission about substantive requirements that these are essentially submissions concerning permissible legislative policy in the exercise of the override authority rather than what constitutes a sufficiently expressed declaration of the override. So basically, the legislature has followed its, its formal requirements and properly invoked the notwithstanding clause. Um, there's no balancing that needs to take place. There's no constitutional review that can be undertaken by a court. Um, that's kind of the end of the story. And François Legault has obviously been the premier of Quebec, of course, has been very happy about this decision and has taken to, to calling the notwithstanding clause the quote unquote legislative supremacy clause. Um, so I'm not surprised by any of this. Uh, I don't like Bill 21. I don't think it's good that if you're a school teacher, particularly in parts of, of the province, um, that do have a lot of religious, cultural, ethnic diversity that you're not allowed to wear a hijab or a kippah. Um, but I, I also think the notwithstanding clause was properly invoked. And now it's a question of political accountability for the National Assembly. Josh, um, any thoughts? Uh, I know that we you went through this, the very challenging exercise of this debate about constitutional review and the notwithstanding clause and the Court of Appeal does not seem to be having it at all. What do you think? 
Yeah, I'm not really surprised that they that they decided that way. Um, you know, if you look at the Ford and Quebec case, it says really clearly that Section 33 lays down requirements of form only, and there's no warrant for importing into it grounds for substantive review of the legislative policy and exercising the override authority in a particular case. And, you know, that's like decades old binding Supreme Court precedent. So um, I, I'm really not surprised that they didn't buy that particular argument in terms of whether they can, you know, judicially review anyway. I think we did that whole podcast, thought a lot about it, and none of us are all that committed to um, our positions on it. So um, I'm curious now just to see whether this goes to the Supreme Court of Canada, whether they'll take this up and if they do, um, what they'll determine. So definitely one to watch and uh, looking forward to digging more into this decision and over the next week. Christine, what about you? Yeah, Josh. So we did that whole podcast where we talked about the the section 30 use of section 33 in Saskatchewan related to this pronoun disclosure in schools. And, um, you know, the Saskatchewan government wants, um, if a student wants to change his or her pronouns, uh, that the school cannot do that without parental consent. And to get around, you know, the charter, they have invoked section 33 or to get around uh, certain provisions of the charter, they've invoked Section 33. And you, we did that whole debate about whether an invocation of Section 33 is um, reviewable and if there can be a declaration. And that the the court in Saskatchewan cited this case. I mean, it's it's not binding authority. They cited the lower court decision in this case. The case is actually called Hack. And do you think that this changes anything for Saskatchewan or if this goes to the Supreme Court it, it would be binding on Saskatchewan. What do you think is going to happen there? Yeah, I'll just say something briefly. So, I mean, it's the Saskatchewan Court of King's Bench versus Quebec Court of Appeal. Like, it's obviously not binding on them, but it's a appeals court decision is a lot more convincing than, uh, you know, an, a decision in a case that's at an early stage in a lower and they court did in mention Saskatchewan, the lower right? court. They did mention the lower court in Saskatchewan in or sorry, the lower court, Saskatchewan's lower court did mention Quebec's lower court as well, because there isn't a lot of law to really lean on here, I guess. So yeah, I also think having the Quebec Court of Appeal dunk on a Quebec academic, Robert Lecky, who is probably the most prominent person calling for um, the availability of constitutional review, doesn't bode well, you know what I mean? <laughs> No, I love not, you, good, not a good day for Lecky, a be yeah. much better day for uh It's always Jeff good to be Zavier. cited. It's always good to True. be cited. <laughs> yeah, I don't think he's happy about that. Well, I guess we don't know. It, it, it's not necessarily, it's not binding, but I think it will. I mean, I think this is ultimately going to end up at the Supreme Court. I mean, I have my complaints that the Supreme Court's not granting leave to enough cases. So maybe they'll evade this one too, but I don't know how they could with the storm coming in Saskatchewan. And this is such a big case. How, how could they resist? That's what I said about many other cases and they still, they resisted. <laughs> true, true. All right, should we move on to bad legal takes? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so my bad legal take this week goes to the Ottawa city councillors who voted last night in favor of a motion, unanimously I should point out, to consider banning fossil fuel ads from city property like buses and recreation facilities because apparently people might see ads from Suncor or Synovus at the hockey rink and not realize that we're in a climate emergency. So this proposal is obviously inspired by that extremely ill-advised stunt by NDP MP Charlie Angus, where he introduced a private member's bill into the House of Commons that would criminalize fossil fuel advertising, a bill that will go nowhere, but got him a day of media coverage, which is probably what he was after. In terms of the Ottawa proposal, this is certainly a prima facie violation of expression. You know, it couldn't be more clear that commercial speech is as protected as any other speech under the charter. And the question is simply whether a court would up, uphold it as uh, demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And I don't actually think courts as crazy as they can sometimes be would uphold this policy. And I say this because last time this type of advertising policy 
targeting particular types of messages reached the Supreme Court was in the Greater Vancouver Transit case. And in that case, there was a union and a uh, student group who were denied access to bus advertising on the basis that it violated the transit agency's policy banning political advertising in order to create a, quote, safe, welcoming environment. And the SEC actually accepted that providing a safe and welcoming environment was a sufficiently important objective to warrant limiting expression. And I don't know about that. I would have found differently. But uh, in any event, they found the actual policy still needed to be rationally connected to the objective. It had to be minimally impairing of the right and the salutary effects of making the environment uh, on the bus safer and more welcoming had to outweigh the deleterious effect on the expression. And in that case, the ban on advertising wasn't even rationally connected to the goal because most political speech doesn't make people feel unsafe or unwelcome. And if we ran through the same sort of Oaks test in this case, a ban on all fossil fuel, fuel advertising would probably also fail the rational connection test since you know, some fossil fuel companies are greener than others. A lot of fossil fuel companies, if not all, are working to reduce emissions. They're working on carbon capture and storage. They're, uh, you know, working on natural gas, which is a greener alternative to coal. And so if you're delusional enough to think that like a few fossil fuel ads on the sides of buses or in hockey rinks in Ottawa is going to somehow uh, fix the climate emergency, the policy proposed on, on that isn't even rational, uh, since it would also ban advertising by fossil fuel companies that aim to reduce emissions. And, you know, even if they come up with some policy that um, addresses that, it's still a total ban and total bans are very difficult to justify under the minimal impairment step of the Oaks test. So at the end of the day, this whole thing is just like a waste of everyone's time and it's just dumb anti-fossil fuels virtue signaling and that's why it's my bad legal take christine what's your bad legal take this week so my bad legal take this week comes from professor professor michael geist it's not actually something michael geist said um it's something that happened to him on linkedin so actually i think linkedin is the one with the bad legal take this week so Professor Geist, who is one of Canada's leading technology lawyers, has been very concerned with the explosive growth of anti-Semitism since October 7th. And he saw some anti-Semitic graffiti at a Toronto bus stop over the weekend. And this, the graffiti said, no more, no service for Jew bastards. Now, obviously, this is very awful and disturbing. And it harkens back to the types of things that happened leading up to the Holocaust. So Geist posted a photo of this graffiti on LinkedIn with the caption, I used to think of these black and white images telling a story of my grandparents that I thought was a horror of the past. To see this appearing in color today on the streets of Toronto, the city where I was born and raised, shakes me to my core. So he posted this. And within an hour, LinkedIn took the post down and they said it violated the site's hate speech guidelines. So in all likelihood, this this first takedown was because of some AI automated content moderation that read the graffiti and automatically removed the post. Because obviously standing alone, that graffiti would would violate the hate speech provisions on the LinkedIn policies. Uh, but obviously, in the context of the caption, this wasn't hate speech. It was sharing concerns about hate. And Professor Geist appealed LinkedIn's takedown. And within 30 minutes, the post was back up. So that's good. But then a few hours later, LinkedIn reversed course and again removed the post saying that, yes, indeed, it does violate our hate speech policies. And I think that this the second takedown is where LinkedIn got it wrong and they are censoring content that is condemning of anti-Semitism and hate. And Geist's post is actually a really important part of the battle against hate and anti-Semitism. And without knowing that anti-Semitic graffiti is being put up, including knowing what that graffiti says, 
people are going to continue to deny that this is a problem that exists. And we see it happening all the time that people deny that there is a problem of rising anti-Semitism. And Geist is trying to draw attention to this. And I think that when combined with the proposed online harms bill, well, C-63, this problem is going to get worse. It's going to include more automated and human censorship because of the liability that's going to be imposed on platforms. And this will have the consequence of silencing people, like in this case, who are actually speaking out against hate and educating people against hate, like Professor Geist. So my bad legal take this week is to LinkedIn, combined with the looming worst legal take in the form of Bill C-63. Joanna, how about you? Okay, mine is going to be quick uh, because there's not a ton of substance here. So my bad legal take of the week goes to the Canadian lawyers for international human rights who have filed a lawsuit uh, yesterday, March 5th, against the Canadian government to stop illegal arms exports to Israel um, out of concern that these arms are being used to commit violations of international humanitarian law. And so the strict sort of bad legal take part, part of this is that it seems like their basis for the assertion um, that it's, you know, a, a settled fact that Israel has committed international humanitarian law is the ICJ January ruling um, in response to the case under the Genocide Convention brought by South Africa. Uh, and this is from their press release. Uh, the ICJ ruling found that a quote unquote plausible case for genocide in Gaza was made out. Uh, this is not an accurate reading of the ICJ decision, which was a prelim preliminary ruling. The ICJ merely reiterated the obligation of Israel, as uh, as all states under the Genocide Convention have an obligation to prevent genocide. Um, that was the upshot of the ruling. Uh, there was not a finding that there was a plausible case that Israel was committing genocide. Um, but look, taking a step back, uh, I just think this decision is a huge uh, exercise in symbolic politics, virtue signaling. It's a waste of time of the court's resources. Um, it's lawfare. I don't think it's being undertaken in good faith. Josh, you had mentioned, I don't know where the Canadian lawyers again for international human rights were um, when Canada was found to be undertaking trade with Saudi Arabia or Turkey, or perhaps what they would have to say for the billions of dollars of aid which have flowed to the uh, flowed to Gaza, which we know has been uh, adopted uh, by Hamas. Um, so look, the question of whether Israel has committed human rights abuses is an open one. Um, I think that will uh, be clear after the fog of war has cleared, um, but I think this is uh, an unwise use of judicial resources um, and it's pure posturing and it is my bad legal take of the week. Josh, why don't you close us out? As usual, we hope you'll rate us, review us and subscribe. And I really do mean go rate us and review us now or I'll launch a lawsuit against you based on international law because apparently you can do that without any real basis. And just a reminder that you can support our work by subscribing to the CCF's YouTube channel, by following us on Twitter, or by visiting the CCF.ca, where you can sign up for our new and improved Freedom Update newsletter. The CCF is a nonpartisan legal charity funded by your donations, so please go to our website and click the blue donate button if you can. Thanks for listening.